Hello, Jeff Zwaring here. Welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and look how they interact with the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to investigate this idea of super habitable planets. Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Thank you. So why don't you just start off the show, Hugh, by defining what does super habitable mean? That's kind of an interesting long word. Uh, kind of flesh out, what, it, what does it mean to be super habitable? Well, it showed up in the scientific literature for the first time. So it's an invented word and basically refers to a planet that is more habitable than our planet Earth. A planet that would actually be a better planet for us to live on than the one we're on right now. So that kind of has the idea that it's just, you know, Earth is very habitable. There are aspects or features of these planets that would allow more life to, to be on them. So, so what are some of those features that they're proposing would make a planet super habitable? Well, they're talking about how if we had a smaller star than our star of the sun, uh, it would burn for a longer period of time. So you'd have a longer potential period of habitability on the planet. And then they said, if you had a slightly bigger planet, there'd be more room for all the life to be there. And if you had a bigger moon, uh, that would generate more tidal forces. And we know that tidal forces on the earth create more habitat space. Those are the three things that they cited uh, for making a planet more habitable than the earth. Okay, so it makes sense that if your planet exists for longer, you can get more life. And if your planet is larger, it can house more life. Uh, kind of flesh out a little bit more detail. What does having more tides do uh, in terms of increasing the amount of life on a planet? Well, we, like on planet Earth, for example, you've got the continents and the oceans and uh, you know, right by the coastal regions, you've got these continental shelves and that's where you get this tidal wash of uh, ocean water and it basically efficiently recycles the nutrients. And they're making the point in the paper, it's on the continental shelves surrounding the continents where you got the greatest diversity of life, mainly because not just of the tidal influence of the moon, but also the tidal influence of the sun. And so they're suggesting if we were to decrease the tidal forces, that would make the circulation of nutrients uh, vital for the life there uh, even more productive. Okay, so, so the idea of having more coastal regions is you just create more environments that allow for a diversity of life, and so you could have more life there just because there's that many nutrients. Kind right. of the idea there? That's the idea, correct. Okay, so at, you know, we're not too far distant from being able to detect planets that would have some of these features. You know, we detect planets around uh, red dwarf stars. We detect planets that are slightly larger than Earth. Um, you know, and, and presumably ones that are closer to their stars and have greater tidal forces. So we have the potential to detect these planets in the near future. Will we find them to be uh, super habitable? What's your expectation there? Well, a paper actually says we've got over two dozen candidate planets that would fit these super habitable criteria. So basically making the point, we've already found some. In fact, they actually cited two uh, that meet these criteria. That's one reason why I wrote the blog on this, because when you actually dig into the details, yes, they meet one of these criteria, but they don't meet the other two. And so they really don't have a candidate yet, but I do agree with them. There would certainly be the potential, as we discover more planets, uh, that they would meet all three of these criteria. But my big concern is, are these three criteria really evidences for superhabitability? Well, and, and that seems to be a pretty important question because I agree with you that we can find planets that are around M dwarfs or that are closer and have more gravitational force or gravitational tidal poles. Um, but the, really the key question is, do, the, do those features actually produce more life on those planets? And that's gonna be quite a ways off before we can detect that. But what are some of the, what, are, what does the research say to this point as to whether uh, these types of planets are actually going to be able to support more life? Well, for example, if you go with a planet that's bigger than the Earth, it's going to have a thicker atmosphere. And a thicker atmosphere is not good for, for habitability. And uh, you probably aren't going to have the kind of plate tectonics that the Earth manifests. In fact, as we actually look at planet Earth, uh, there's a lot of evidence. It's the biggest it could possibly be and still be habitable. And so finding a bigger planet 
I don't think makes for super habitability. It's the opposite. And likewise, going for a smaller star, yes, it'll burn longer, but it's not going to be as stable as our star, the sun. It's going to have greater flaring activity. And again, there's a lot of evidence that stars more massive than our sun or less massive than our sun are going to have planets that will be less habitable than the Earth. So yeah, my main critique of this paper is the three criteria they listed are not criteria for superhabitability, but basically make it the point uh, that when you look at the characteristics of our star, our planet, and our moon, it's the most habitable that the physics could possibly allow. Well, let, let's kind of, if, if we could go back there, I just want to dig in a, to a couple of the statements you made there. You said that a bigger planet is going to have a more dense atmosphere, and that's going to be less habitable for life. And you also said that a younger star or, or a, an M dwarf star is going to have more flaring activity, and that's going to be uh, more problematic for life. Kind of or give us some of the details. What is it about those two features that make it less probable or less likely for life or less uh, beneficial for life uh, as opposed to super habitable? Well, if we go with a star that's slightly less massive than our star, the sun, or slightly more massive, it's going to have not only greater flaring activity, its luminosity will not be as stable. Uh, there's recent research, in fact, I wrote a blog on this, how of all the stars that we know exist in our galaxy, our sun measures to be five times more stable in its luminosity than any other known star. So going with a smaller star actually is going to make things worse. And yes, the smaller the star, uh, the more serious will be its flares. And flares are accompanied with dangerous radiation for light. I don't think it'll bother bacteria, but it certainly would be a problem uh, for advanced plants and mammals and birds. So if you've got one of these smaller or larger stars that have more flaring activity, uh, the, the larger organisms are just going to be subject to more radiation, which will limit the types of complex life you're going to have on a planet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you're going to have less diversity. I mean, I, I could conceive of a planet having just as much biomass as the Earth, but it's all going to be bacteria. Uh, but if you want diversity like you have here on Earth, and you do not want to go with a larger star or a smaller star, you want a star exactly like the sun. And presumably, if you have a thicker atmosphere, you're going to have a similar sort of restriction. There may be more life across the planet, but it's going to be less complex and less diverse, correct? Because uh, if you want advanced life, like advanced animals, you need them to have lungs. Lungs are where you get the greatest uh, you know, uh, met metabolic capability. However, lungs can only function within a certain air pressure range, and they need a certain composition in the atmosphere in order to work. And if you go with a bigger planet, you're not going to have that. And if you go with a bigger planet, you're not likely to have the kind of plate tectonic activity lasting as long as it does on Earth. And moreover, you probably aren't going to have a nice, strong, long-lasting, stable uh, magnetic field. Well, thank you very much, Hugh. I appreciate your comments. You know, when we look out uh, in, the, in the galaxy and in the universe, we're actually able to find a lot of planets out there. And it does really raise this question, is Earth as, as habitable as can be? Or are there places where you could have better habitability? What's fascinating is that as we do research and go out and investigate, it really does seem like the Earth is kind of the ideal habitat. It allows the maximum amount of life, but not just the maximum amount of life, but the maximum diversity of life, particularly of complex creatures like us. And it seems like God did that with a purpose. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's latest blog on this. Do super habitable planets exist? It will give you great insight into what it takes to make a habitable planet, as well as how you can use those features to go out and show how that they point to a creator who created this universe with us in mind.